Welcome back. Okay, this is the slide I believe that I left off with before, and this reviews the term homology. As you hopefully remember, ho homo means alike or the same. And what are we talking about? We are talking about structures having the same shape. And as we'll review in a minute, as you can read, these are homologies are good indicators of common evolutionary past. So again, what do we mean by homologous structures? Well, you'll actually get to look at some of these when we meet in um, face to face on, I believe it is Thursday. And you can see for yourself the humerus of a human and a cat and a monkey. And these bones are in the forelimb of a, a human arm and a monkey forelimb and a cat front leg. And even though our forelimbs look very different and are used for different purposes, the bones themselves have this incredibly, incredibly similar shape. I don't think we'll get to look at a, a whale or a bat humerus, but they're similar down to every little nook and cranny. And we know that these very similar, similar characteristics are caused by very, very similar genes. And so there you have it. If animals have very, very similar or sometimes even identical genes, where do we get our genes from? Our ancestors. And so, again, identical structures, or very, very similar structures, I should say, or homologous structures point to recent common ancestry. And so, therefore, homologous structures are very, very useful in the, the science of systematics, um, of classifying animals and plants, etc., based on their evolutionary heritage. All right. But there is a caveat caveat, I believe, comes from a Latin word, which means warning. So here's your warning. If you're classifying um, animals or um, other living things according to their structures, similar shapes, similar morphologies are not always due to close common ancestry. Can you think of any examples? Well, hey, I'm, I'm the professor, so you know if not, I can give you a couple. How about, for instance, the eye of a human and the eye of an octopus? Now again, doesn't take a rocket scientist, or maybe I should say it doesn't take a marine biologist to recognize that a human and an octopus, even though we're both animals, we're not very closely related. I mean, we have bones, an octopus does not. It is what we call an invertebrate animal. But we both have these very complex eyes. And as you'll see in a moment, that is, uh, this is an example of what we call convergent evolution. All right, you might consider the Bird, the wing of a bird to be similar to a wing of a dragonfly, but a bird is not very closely related to a dragonfly. And this is one of my favorite examples. On top here, we have a picture of a marsupial mole. This is a pouched mammal, just like the kangaroo that you watched in the video. It gives birth to basically an embryo that has to crawl out from the um, female's vaginal birth canal area and crawl up into the pouch to find the nipples, to find the milk. Whereas the North American mole are placental mammals. Again, they give birth to a young that's much more advanced in development. Just like cats give birth to baby kittens that don't look like embryos when they're born. They, they look like little cats. So these are two mammals that are not very closely related by evolution. Um, in fact, think of it this way. You, as a human, are more closely related to this ma this mammal, this black mole right here, than they are to each other. I'll repeat this because this is very important. You, listening to this, you, you, as a human, are more closely related to this mole than these two moles are related to each other. Again, because we are both placental mammals, you and this bottom mole here are more closely related by evolution. So why do they look so similar? Because they live in very, very similar environments. And so their shape has been molded, if you will, by the environment. So let's put this together. The original term I gave you was convergent evolution. And, and that's the term that I have always preferred. So similar selection pressures, again, natural selection result in similar appearances, similar morphologies in distantly related organisms. And the first example I gave you of that was the eye of the octopus and the eye of a human. Both, both these eyes are very complex in nature, but again, they're not evidence of a close evolutionary relationship between humans and octopi. Now, just to confuse things, well, maybe not just to confuse things, your book refers to convergent 
structures um, that are the result of convergent evolution as analogies. All right, so I don't know. I, I just don't, I don't personally prefer this term. I don't find it as intuitively obvious. But then just to confuse things even more, a newer term has emerged, which is homoplasies. So I guess this word does make sense if you think of plasies like plastic. And so you would say that these two animals that we just looked at, they are molded into similar shapes by similar selection pressures. So it's like homo, similar, plastic, molding shape. So I guess that term does make sense. But the problem word homoplasies is easy to confuse with homology. So again, homology are two structures that are evidence of of close a close evolutionary relationship because they have the similar genes are causing the similar structures. Here, these homoplasies, aka analogies, aka um, convergent evolution, these are all examples of structures that are similar in organisms that are not not closely related. The moral of the story, just to memorize, the term convergent evolution and the term analogies and the term homoplasies all pretty much mean the same thing, okay? <laughs> so that's our caveat. When we look at structures, they're not always evidence of um, a close evolutionary relationship. So when we do our systematics, when we construct our um, phylogenetic trees, we have to be ca cautious of this. All right, so back to constructing these evolutionary trees. Remember, here that whatever evolutionary tree that you see, also called phylogenetic trees, it resents our current hypothesis regarding the organism's evolutionary relationship. All right, and so this is very, very important. When you see these evolutionary trees, they're not set in stone. As we discover new fossils, as we analyze new, more molecular data, we might need to move some twigs on that tree. So this is important. A phylogenetic tree is our working hypothesis. And now cladistics, a tool which I'm about to introduce you to, is useful in constructing these phylogenetic trees. And you know, we're just going to play a little game to get you used to that. All right, important term in cladistics, of course, is the word clade. So this is an important definition for you to memorize. I ask you to actually memorize very few definitions, but this would be one. So a clade always includes an ancestral species and all of its descendants, okay? A clade include, is a grouping, I should say, is a grouping which includes an ancestral species and all its descendants. So what we're about to do in the next little mini lecture is play a little game called clade or no clade. I'll see you there.